How you doing? I feel like I match the lights, right? My husband always says I look like a tennis ball in this sweater. Uh, my name is Ami. I'm here to talk about building simple products. Um, it's my first time at Slush. I can see why people love it. Uh, a little about me, they gave you a quick background. I'm currently Chief Pro Product Officer at FAIR, which is a marketplace for local independent retailers. I led product design at WhatsApp as we grew into the largest messaging app in the world. I was head of product for Facebook ads, and I was uh, part of Instagram as we scaled the company post-meta acquisition. Um, so I've spent a lot of my career scaling products and scaling teams. Um, I also write about a bunch of the shortcuts I've learned at my Substack called The Hard Parts of Growth. Um, and I've spent a, a lot of my career in product, but I've also spent a lot of it doing everything else in technology. I've worked in marketing, in comms, in policy. I ran a tech VC fund. So it's been a little bit of a tech buffet uh, over the, the 20 years of my career. I also have three young children, which, uh, as you can probably tell, is the opposite of simplicity. Um, and one of the reasons I am even more passionate about simplifying and the first question I normally get is, why simplify? Why am I so obsessed with simplicity? Uh, my husband would say it's because I am naturally lazy, and simplifying is just an excuse to do less work. I would say, that's true. Remember, laziness is just another word for efficiency with less good branding. But the real reason is that the world feels very complicated. And when the world feels complicated, Simplicity is a competitive advantage. I think about it like the physical laws of pressure. You know, imagine you have a great idea, but then you bury it with a bunch of other information. Even if that other information is good, the power of your idea gets lost. It's like mashing potatoes. You have to push really hard to make an impact and get your point across. And at the end, your audience is kind of bludgeoned. But imagine if you took that great idea and you honed it down. Then you have a knife, and all the weight and force of your idea come through without effort. And to me, simplicity is like a knife. And a knife only works because everything unnecessary has been removed. That is literally the definition of sharpening a knife. And a knife's one of the most successful products out there. Think about it, it's been around for two and a half million years. There's one in every home. And so when I think about simplicity, I think about all the things that you can create when you have that sharp blade. It makes it easier to create things that matter to people, whether that's a meal or a sculpture or a technology product. And so today, I'll share some of the lessons I've learned about how simplicity has just made it easier to address the core questions of product building. Things like, what should I build, or product strategy? How should I build product design? Or how do I tell the story, which is about communications? And these have applied at all different phases and scales of company and products. So whether you're founding your first company or you're scaling your 15th company, I hope there's something in here that works for you. Uh, I'll start by talking about WhatsApp, which is one of the simplest products that I know. Um, and, but I'll also weave in some examples from around the industry so you can see how universal these principles are. Let's start with product strategy. So when I joined WhatsApp, I had so many ideas for all the things I wanted to build, all the new technologies I wanted to use, all the ways I was going to monetize. I think that's pretty typical. You know, when we join these, uh, these products or create them, we have, so, we have a grand vision for what we want to build. Um, but what I learned is that it didn't make sense to ship all the things that I wanted, because our users would feel overwhelmed or confused, maybe even ashamed that they didn't understand all of it. And look, I get it. I build these kinds of products for a living. I still get disoriented when my apps change on me. You know, it's like someone came into my house and rearranged my furniture, and now I'm banging my knees on a sofa in the middle of the night that didn't used to be there. And so for WhatsApp, simplicity actually turned out to be the key to making the product work for so many of our users. We had to decide what was truly indispensable to this product and double down on that. And what did we want to build? Well, in WhatsApp, we wanted to give everyone 
the feeling of being with their friends and family, even when they were separated by geography or circumstance. And when we were building, we had in mind global users. So these are often people in emerging markets with low-end devices. And for them, being there meant that their calls and messages went through every time for free. And so that's the first thing we always had to resource. We had to slow down everything else in our roadmap to make sure that calling and messaging was rock solid. And I'll tell you, that was not always easy, because we would look at other teams or apps building advanced photo editing or the latest AI models and sometimes be kind of jealous. But that focus on that core indispensable vision, uh, that core indispensable vision cut through any confusion for our users. You know, no one ever had to ask, what is this product for or how do you use it? They know what it's for. It's for calling and messaging. And that's how people used it and kept using it. And after we established that baseline, we earned the right to add more on top. And so that's the question I always start with when we're talking about product strategy. Just what makes your product indispensable? Not uh, fun, not flashy, not innovative, but truly indispensable. If you're sharpening a knife, does your knife need to cut through bone, or does it need to cut through bread? And can you do that 100%? For another industry example, I think about bourbon. Uh, which is an app that launched a while ago, you could do all sorts of things on it. You could check in, you could make plans, you could earn points, you could share photos, but it never really got traction. And so the founders, Kevin and Mike, decided to chop out everything except sharing photos and relaunch it. Do folks remember what, what they renamed this? That's right. Uh, this is Instagram. And it only really got traction after it simplified down to just sharing photos. One shortcut that I use here is that it's not prioritization until it hurts. I think sometimes we think about simplifying as, OK, that makes sense. I just won't do the bad stuff. But that doesn't work. We're already not doing the bad stuff. What true simplification means is cutting a bunch of good stuff so we can focus on the best. If I'm not sad about a few of the things that I'm cutting, I am not cutting deep enough. Now, of course, we've got to use judgment in this as all things. If you are keeping medical devices running, if you are keeping planes in the air, I'm flying home later this week. Please don't cut anything. Every edge case matters. <laughs> but for most of us, we can start with the one use case that is the most indispensable to our users. All right, let's talk about how to build, which is about design. Now, no one walks up to a knife and says, hey, what is this thing? How do I use it? Where do I hold it? Right? You say, oh, where's the bread? I'll make a cheese plate. Even children can use knives. Is it bad that I give my three-year-old a knife? He's on eggplant duty. It's fine. But the reason he can use it is because it's so intuitive and familiar. And that's the question I think we should ask, which is, what makes your product familiar? Now, if we think about WhatsApp, remember, we're talking about global users. So we don't actually know that much about them. We don't know how old they are. We don't know how familiar they are with technology. Really, the only thing we know about them is that they have a phone. And so we decide to mirror the patterns in the phone. So if Android puts its floating action button there on the bottom right, that's where WhatsApp puts its button. And so even if you've never used the app before, when you pick it up, it should automatically feel familiar, because you're used to those patterns from the phone. Of course, we do the same thing inside the app. We make sure that those actions are consistent. And I don't mean anything too fancy. I just mean when you see this arrow, you know you're going to send a message. When you see the right arrow, you know you're not going to send a message. There's another screen coming. You've got more time to change your mind. Now, as you can imagine, this was extremely limiting because there were all these new, exciting gestures, interaction patterns we wanted to use, but we couldn't because they weren't already accessible to our customers. Uh, we really had to prioritize because just like there's not that many ways to hold a knife, there's not that many ways to swipe a message. So the question we always had to ask was, where is the user naturally going to put their thumb? And can we put the button there? 
And with today's technology, you can do even more of that. You know, if you're watching a hot jar recording, where are they pulling their mouse? Where are their eyes tracking? Put the button there. That's the user telling us what's familiar to them and what's expected. For another industry example, let's talk about all these new Gen AI products. This is wildly complicated frontier technology. And yet, it's been picked up by hundreds of millions of users basically overnight. How does that happen? Because even though the technology is complicated, the way we interact with it borrows heavily from the same messaging interfaces that we've been trained on for literally decades. And so the fact that these systems borrow from existing interface patterns means that they're usable by everyone immediately. One shortcut here that's worked for me is to use design systems. That means things like you build a button once, and then you can drop that button in wherever you need to. It always looks the same. It always acts the same. So it's simpler to build, but it's also really predictable for your users. And that means your app becomes simple by default. And so when you're thinking about what to build, think about, or how to build, think about what makes your product feel familiar. So your users never have to think about how do they use this product, what do they need to learn. They can just pick it up and get started. All right, now let's talk about how to tell the story. Does this look familiar? This is the narrative arc. This is the pattern that almost every story we tell follows. I know you're thinking, why is this lady taking us on a detour through high school literature class? Well, of course, I always wanted to be a high school teacher. But more importantly, it's because this arc has been bred into us over generations. And so if we can hook our products and our stories about what we're building into this arc, it's automatically more resonant and meaningful to our customers. Now, I'm often tempted to start with a grand new vision and, and explanation for the big new problem in the world and the way my brand new technology is going to solve it. But what I've learned over decades of building different kinds of products is that even as technology changes, human underlying emotions stay pretty stable. I'm talking about core stuff, like the need for connection or status or safety. And so that's the challenge when it comes to storytelling, which is you don't need to invent new problems. You don't sharpen a knife by adding more. That makes it heavy and unwieldy. Instead, the challenge is to discover what are the stories that your customers are already telling about their problems and their lives, and how does your product solve that for them? Where does your product hook into the stories they're telling themselves already? I've always learned those stories by talking to customers. And so for WhatsApp, it was when a user said, WhatsApp isn't an app, it's like a part of my arm. And that kind of bloomed into the central metaphor of WhatsApp being like face-to-face -face communication. And then we could borrow all of these analogies for how stuff works in the physical world. It even helped us figure out what to build and how to build. So for instance, when we wanted to build disappearing messages, which is a product that could be pretty complicated, we thought, well, how does this work in the physical world? Do you keep all the mail you receive? No, I bet you recycle most of it immediately. And what you keep is, is what's truly special. And so that's how disappearing messages works also. It automatically deletes the messages you get, except for what you choose to keep. And so when you scroll back through your chat with a friend, what you see is almost like a scrapbook of the most important letters you've exchanged. It's the most special messages that you've chosen to keep there. And this analogy helped a product that could have been very complicated for our users actually feel pretty intuitive. For another industry example, Airbnb famously did this exercise called Snow White, where they mapped out entire end-to-end -end user journey and storyboarded how every user felt at every point and what the product was doing at that time. And that helped them see where they needed to update the product to match how the user felt or pinpoint the places where they could invest in building more trust at that moment with the user. That was a huge differentiation at a time when you know, renting a room in a stranger's house could still feel very scary. The shortcut I use here is just to ask a few simple questions. 
which is at this step in the product, how do I want my customers to feel? And when else in their lives do they feel that way? Is there anything I can borrow from those life experiences that'll make it easier for them to feel the same way at this step in the product? And then that gives me a way to simplify how my product fits into the stories my users are already telling about their lives and what's important to them. It automatically makes my product feel more meaningful and like the answer to a problem they already have. Okay, so maybe you say, all right, Ami, you have convinced me I am all in on simplicity, but how do I know what to simplify? How do I know whether this knife needs to cut through bone or cut through bread? And the best idea I have here is to spend even more time with the customer, which sounds easy, but is very hard. If you're anything like me, the reason it's hard is because you have to be patient. Just like you have to be patient when sharpening a knife. That's hard. When you're scaling a company, you have so much other stuff to do. I know I always have a countdown clock in my head, and every 30 minutes I'm trying to calculate, what's the ROI on this slot? And I have to tell you, customer empathy does not feel high ROI in the short term. It almost feels the opposite. And you know, how many times have you seen a customer use your product and just wanted to jump across the table and say, there's a button right there. I built it for you. It's like a punch in the gut. But even though customer empathy doesn't feel high ROI in the short term, it is the highest ROI in the long term because it tells you what to build today and what to build next. Here's some tactics I've picked up over the years. Every week or two, I hold a slot on my calendar for something customer related. I normally do this on Friday afternoons. Let's be honest, I'm not getting anything else done at that point in the day. And that forces me to find something to do to get closer to customers. That could be as simple as just using the product. Uh, it's remarkable what you can learn from just watching reviews. Who's reviewing my product? What do they say works? What do they say doesn't? I can join user research. I can read support tickets. I can watch hot jar sessions. What works best for me is to actually visit customers. So I work at FAIR. Our customers are local independent retailers. I can literally just walk into shops in my neighborhood and ask them, hey, where do you get your goods? How do you think about FAIR? It's kind of retail therapy disguised as customer research. Uh, I don't think that's cheating. I think that, don't tell my boss. One of the customers I talked to recently was a nursing director at a local hospital in San Francisco where I live. And what she said to me was, FAIR changed my life. You know, with FAIR, I can run a little gift shop right in the labor and delivery unit that I work in. And that means new families, when they have their first babies, they can go home with everything they need. And that just makes that first week or two so much easier. And you know, I've had three kids. I remember how vulnerable and terrible it is to not know what you need to do next or whether you have everything you need. And so to me, this was very meaningful. I cried, she cried, it was a mess. But you can believe that whenever I'm building a product, I have in my head, is this simple enough that Nancy's going to be able to use it in the five minutes that she has in between running around delivering babies when all she wants to do is restock cozy baby blankets. My goal when I talk to customers is always to hear the words, your product changed my life. Because when I hear that, my knife is sharp. I know what to build next. I can push for it because I'm just advocating for the customer. My team has a sense of urgency because we know who we're accountable for. And it cuts through any disagreement inside the company because now we've all heard what we need to do. We can turn that into a question of trade-offs of how we're going to get there the best. But I know this is an audience of founders and builders and investors. We want cold, hard facts. So how does a focus on simplicity actually translate into business results? Well, for WhatsApp, the app kept growing. It's at 2 billion users, 100 billion messages a day, 2 billion calls a day. And you know, I learned something interesting, which is even though we were building this app to be simple enough that it works for anyone in the world, it actually works well for everyone, even people here with the latest pixels and iPhones. Because all of us live in this complicated world, 
And for everyone, simplicity is a competitive advantage. I can also tell you how it's working at FAIR. You know, FAIR is a two-sided wholesale marketplace. It's a notoriously complicated business. We serve two different kinds of customers on both sides of the market. We have, like every marketplace, really unique and complex unit economics. So how does simplicity work for us? Well, we applied a bunch of these same lessons. You know, instead of having 50 different priorities that were all really important, we simplified down to an eight most important that stacked into an indispensable product for our customers. We streamlined all of our core flows from sign up to discovery to checkout. Our customers talk about FAIR like a 24-7 trade show, so that's what we talk about in our marketing. And we organize our teams around customer jobs to be done. So we're always rooted in a particular customer problem. And what are the results? Well, at a time when consumer spending is down and most global marketplaces see decline in growth, FAIR's growth rate has doubled because customers are finding more value from our products and we're getting more efficient about building it. I like this slide because it is totally accurate and yet tells you absolutely nothing thanks to my strategic cropping. Turns out labels do matter. And so as a quick recap, uh, here's my list. I know my lists are major eldest daughter energy. I am an eldest daughter. I embrace it. When you're thinking about what to build, build what makes your product indispensable. Do your customers need to cut through bone or do they need to cut through bread? When you're thinking about how to build, build what makes your product feel familiar. So they never have to learn how to use your product. They can just pick it up and start going. When you're thinking about storytelling, discover the story that your customers are already telling about their problems and their lives, and hook your product into that. And if you're unsure what to do, find the customer who says, your product changed my life. Now, I'll tell you a secret, which is even though I am totally bought in on simplicity, it is a fight to operate this way. Because when you're scaling a, a team or a company, there's so many interesting things to focus on. You've got to think about org alignment. You've got to think about your two-by-two -two strategy that you can show all of your investors to impress everyone with what you're doing. And those are super interesting. But I have to be honest, they're often temptations away from the core job of building a product that our customers find indispensable. And I think sometimes it's a point of pride to engage with all this complexity because it's so interesting and exciting. But I'm here to argue the opposite case, that there's so much value to be created by building products that are simple. Think of all the successful companies that were built on the premise of simplicity. PayPal lets you send money by just using an email address instead of complicated credit card details. Nest was successful because it's a simple, turnable dial instead of a wild, programmable thermostat. Uh, Square, simplified point of sale, notoriously difficult process. Dropbox makes file syncing as easy as saving to a local folder. And Spotify constantly cuts features and relaunches and grows faster as a result. And that's why simplicity matters, because simplicity makes the hard stuff feel easy. And when you do that, your product is automatically more accessible to so many more people. That benefits your customers, and then it also benefits your business. And those lessons of simplifying by taking things away, I found to be pretty universal. They've helped me build more successful products. They've helped me scale more successful teams. They even helped me focus on what matters in my life. And that's why I'm constantly writing about ways to simplify on my blog at the hard parts of growth and why I'm excited to share these tips with you about building simple products. So I hope some of these help make it easier for you to scale your products and your companies in a way that makes your life and your customers' lives a little simpler. Thank you. <laughs>